defy the war-torn skies of Europe with Hitler's mighty Luftwaffe. Huge for its day, Messerschmitt's 321 was the aerial supply line for Hitler's blitzkrieg attacks. An innovation in transport technology, this powerful carrier enabled the Germans to deploy men and machinery to all regions of the war. Tonight, fly with the elite airmen of the Third Reich on wings of the Luftwaffe. This is the Antonov 124. It's a truly massive machine with interior cargo space that would encompass nearly half a football field. This giant Soviet transport jet is a marvel of modern engineering. But the wide-bodied concept can be traced back to the early days of World War II, as Hitler's forces were poised to strike at England. With its hinged nose for forward loading and kneeling landing gear that lowers the cabin for taking on cargo, the 124 is an aerial freighter of the modern shipping lanes of the sky. Inside, the cargo deck is cavernous. Over 40 yards long, it takes on the kind of maritime proportions known in earlier days only to ocean-going vessels. This mammoth machine can carry over 115 tons of freight and take it to any corner of the earth. Never in their most fantastic dreams could the early pioneers of flight have envisioned such a colossal aircraft. The Antonov six-man crew may take their upcoming journey as a matter of course, but the road to that journey was long and difficult and harks back to an earlier time, back to an era of incredible advancement and immeasurable suffering. The gigant, or giant, Messerschmitt's ME-323 was truly colossal. The largest operational aircraft of the Second World War, the six-engine plane was first conceived as a massive glider, but instead served on many fronts as a workhorse of the Luftwaffe's transport arm. Originally intended for the invasion of England, the Gigant was to be the key player in an entirely new kind of war, a war based on the mobility of force. In the muddy hell that was the First World War, two massive armies were locked in a struggle of death and carnage that was unremitting. Immobile, their trenches stretched from the North Sea to the Swiss frontier. Between them lay a corpse-ridden, barren netherworld called No Man's Land. Like Dante's inner circle of hell, it was a nightmare of fire and pocked earth filled with the wails of the wounded and the dying. Without the room or the capability to outflank one another, men were hurled into a withering storm of enemy fire in a ritual of sacrifice performed daily. After four years of bloodshed, the front line in some areas had moved only yards. For this precious territory, eight and a half million men died. The wounded drowned in the mud by the thousands. Dead and decaying bodies littered the trenches for months at a time. Above the armies on the ground, modern machine weapons filled the air with a lethal sleet of steel. These same weapons made offensive warfare obsolete. Every attack had to be a frontal attack. And for the first time in history, war became a stagnant, continuous affair, with two great armies trapped for years within earshot of one another. Early in the war, the airplane served primarily as an observation platform. Soon, more aggressive pilots began taking pistols, bombs, and even bricks up with them. The dawn of aerial warfare had arrived. Over time, aircraft production increased, 
as strategists began to ponder the offensive capabilities of this new weapon. But for the most part, their role was limited to dogfights high over the trenches. Their individual victories or defeats had little effect on the tragic stalemate below. The massive supplies needed by the huge armies at the front were still moved by conventional modes of transport. From railhead supply depots, lines of trucks and wagons headed endlessly to the front. Little or no consideration was given to using the airplane to transport men and material. The taxis of Paris ferried thousands of French troops into action to halt the initial German advance. The notion of moving heavy cargo or troops by air didn't really take root until the Second World War. Surprisingly, the seeds of that development go back to the late 1800s and Germany's Otto Lilienthal, who pioneered the first controllable glider. In the years following the First World War, Germany's long affair with gliding became passionate. The Treaty of Versailles had dramatically limited the construction of powered aircraft, and soon gliding and soaring, exempt from these limitations, became favorite pastimes. In East Prussia, throughout the 20s and 30s, inventive designers took peacefully to the air and became national sporting heroes. Bridging the gap between powered and unpowered aircraft were a small handful of motorized gliders such as Arta Martin's Max, powered by a 15 horsepower two-cylinder air-cooled engine. Aberrations like this were few, but set an important precedent for the years to come. It was a period of curiosity and innovation. Hybrids were many and varied. Some, like this canard configuration, were quite unorthodox for their day. The most important European glider meets in the 1920s were held on the rounded slopes of the Wasserkuppe, high in the Rhone Mountains of central Germany. Hundreds gathered to watch these handmade craft take to the air. The fair-like atmosphere gave spectators the needed distraction from the storm of despair enveloping Germany. More important, they taught young designers and future pilots skills that would soon serve a new Deutschland. Pilot Eric Sommer remembers those early days. So in 1933, I got the first connection with flying by uh, doing gliding, starting gliding in the old Zögling. It was a dreadful contraption. You jumped only about five meters high and then you uh, set it straight away down again and you started with a banshee. A banshee is a long rubber rope, ten people pulled it and then they released the aircraft, the bloke sitting behind there and you were pushed into the air and then you had maybe a 50 meter jump and then you landed again. And flew at a sink rate of a terrific sink rate, you can get down like a, like a lift again or you couldn't terminal with it, yeah? you just could glide down from an elevated position and land again, so that was all the training you got. The Wasser Cooper gliding meets of the 1930s are now considered by many the golden age of soaring. Creative aeronautical developments and an infusion of new blood reinvigorated an aviation community still reeling from the effects of the First World War. An entirely new science arose from the ashes of world conflict. Here in the Rhone Mountains, new aerodynamics were eagerly put to the test by simple craft that were easy to repair. New discoveries abounded, and failure was an affordable luxury that often resulted in a solution. Lessons learned paved the way to steady advancement, 
It wasn't long before crude early gliders with endurance spans measured in seconds gave way to sophisticated designs capable of staying aloft for hours. The work that went on here had a profound effect on the future of aviation. For the young men of the Vasa Cooper, soaring and gliding would soon give way to other, much more lethal forms of competition. As the winds of the Rhone were quietly ushering in a new era in aviation, back in the towns and cities, the rising tide of national socialism was profoundly changing German civilization. Huge rallies like this one at Nuremberg in 1934 displayed the fanatic zeal and frightening precision of Hitler's followers. The average German yearned for lost pride. These massive spectacles gave them a sense of strength and cohesion. Hitler was a master manipulator, and these spectacles took on religious overtones the Germans came to worship a new god. Their armies had been taken from them, and their economy lay in ruins. At one point, the mark's value plummeted to four billion to the dollar. But things were about to change. He spoke directly to their fears. He promised them pride and dignity and strength. And they adored him for it. The desire for strength was something the Führer understood all too well. Resurrecting Germany's armed forces was the first step. Government-sponsored competitions fostered a new generation of aviation-minded warriors. And in resurrecting Germany's air force, now called the Luftwaffe, the glider and its tender crop of pilots was the perfect place to start. Designs generated in the peaceful mountains of the Rhone would be turned into lethal tools of war. Research carried on there would affect future German aircraft from the tiny Comet rocket fighter to the huge 323 Gigant glider. Young boys skilled in aviation would trade the toys of childhood for newer and more destructive ones. In the cause of Nazism, many would soon fly to Pyrrhic glory and early death. By 1935, Hitler had openly discarded the Treaty of Versailles. As the world watched with muted protest, Germany rearmed. Gliders like the Hearth Minimoa helped push Germany to the forefront of aviation. With new weapons readied and a new breed of devout followers trained to use them, Hitler's Reich was poised to drag Europe into the darkest epic yet known to man. On September the 1st, 1939, German forces smashed through Poland. It was called Blitzkrieg or lightning war, and revolutionized the rules of combat. Fast tanks and mobile infantry surged forward under the Luftwaffe's aerial umbrella. Shocked Polish forces crumbled before the onslaught. In little more than three weeks, the Nazi victory was complete. In the west, France prepared for the German attack by reinforcing its impregnable Maginot Line. A glorified reincarnation of the First World War trench encased in concrete, it took seven years to build and stretched 87 miles. 
The Maginot Line was studded with heavy guns. The French mobilized five million men and dispersed them throughout. 100 feet deep in places, their 1,200-man garrisons enjoyed good food and even planted roses to battle their main enemy, boredom. When the battle came, it would prove to be simply an echo of the past. German strategists had learned a great deal from Soviet paradrops during their assault on Finland. It was a tactic that had fired the Fuhrer's imagination and was perfectly suited to the mobility demanded by lightning war. In fact, German parachute research had been underway for nearly a decade. This parakite experiment was conducted in the early 1930s. The most noteworthy gains were made at the Graf Zeppelin Research Center, where the ribbon parachute and the stability of the solid parachute were pioneered. In these experiments lay the foundations of the first airborne combat units. By the late 1930s, paratroopers, highly skilled thanks to exhausted training, were vital in the Nazi sweep across Western Europe. Crack troops, they were part of Goering's Luftwaffe, and about 4,000 strong. In any other type of unit, many would have been officers. When the Wehrmacht troops plunged into Holland in May 1940, airdrops were used to secure key bridges across the many canals there. German paratroopers even dropped into Rotterdam Sports Stadium, then rode tram cars to relieve beleaguered colleagues fighting to hold a bridge on the other side of town. JU-52s were used for these operations, and the men were capable of joining combat the moment they touched the ground. Any extra equipment was dropped in separate canvas containers. But the paratrooper was only one part of Hitler's airborne army. Gliders, too, were put into action. And unlike the dispersion caused by massive paradrops, glider troops, some 12,000 hand-picked men, landed silently and together. Moreover, they were able to go into action more heavily armed than their parachute-borne comrades. One early assault glider was the DFS-230, it was small and fast and was usually towed by the JU-52. It could take eight fully armed troops deep inside enemy lines. In one of the war's most daring ventures planned by Hitler himself, 41 230s packed with 85 crack assault troops landed on top of the so-called impregnable Belgian fortress Eben Emal and subdued a garrison nearly ten times their number. The FS-230 had accomplished the impossible, but it was small. And soon the Luftwaffe, with even greater victories in mind, put a much larger assault glider into operation. The Gotha GO-242 could carry 21 fully equipped combat troops. And within a year of its first flight tests, it was sent into action. Often towed by a Heinkel HE-111H, the 242 sometimes used rockets to assist in takeoff. It first flew into battle in the Middle East and was later sent to the icy fringes of the Russian front. Fortresses like Eben Emal fell quickly to troops borne by gliders who had learned their art years before in the Rhön Mountains. A trained flyer released 12 miles from his target could soar silently and land his deadly cargo in a circle 44 yards across. Emal and the emplacements of the Maginot Line proved to be monuments to the ignorance of strategists living in the past. A new kind of fluid warfare, using new types of weapons and tactics, like the glider-borne assault, had made them obsolete. In a few short weeks, the victory that had eluded them over the four desperate years of the First World War was finally theirs.
Nearly half a million Allied troops were now packed into their last foothold on the continent, Dunkirk. In one of the true miracles of the war, ships and boats of every imaginable shape and size headed across the channel to evacuate the trapped army. Surrounded with their backs against the sea, they were strapped and bombed by an unchallenged Luftwaffe. On the beaches, there was nowhere to hide. Thousands died in the hail of fire. Incredibly, nearly 350,000 made it back to England. Britain now stood entirely alone. A narrow strip of water was the last barrier between the German armies and their total victory. The English Channel. The Führer and his deputies commenced planning Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of the British Isles. But in time, Dover's white cliffs would prove a fortress that even Hitler's armies couldn't overcome. Two hundred and fifty thousand Nazi troops were to assault the British coast in three mighty waves. The Luftwaffe called for the construction of huge gliders. They would have to be capable of carrying 22 tons of freight, including an 88 mm anti-aircraft gun and a Panzer IV tank, or more than 100 fully equipped combat troops. The Junkers and Messerschmitt companies both submitted designs. The Junkers proved an abysmal failure. Messerschmitt's ME321 went into production. Britain prepared to defend herself. Minefields were sown. Every able-bodied man was called to arms. The Home Guard, using the rawest of recruits, patrolled England's 5,000-mile coastline with shotguns, hunting rifles, and even pitchforks. Businessmen became soldiers in a matter of weeks. Hitler boasted, I prophesy that a great empire will be destroyed. A vital tool of that destruction was to be Messerschmitt's ME321 Gigat superglider. First rolled out in February of 1941, its wings spanned over 180 feet, and the fuselage was more than 92 feet long. Even now, it remains the second largest glider ever built. It was colossal in every way, with its hinged, clamshell-like nose doors, providing unlimited access to the split-level cargo hold. Troops, tanks, and other cargo were loaded via ladders and ramps. Heavy equipment, like a Panzer Battalion's motorcycles, were carried on the stronger flooring below. It was usually left to the soldiers themselves to load the cargo manually, because no power winches or tow cables existed. The cavernous glider could even accommodate light artillery pieces. Fully loaded, it weighed nearly 44 tons and soared at about 87 miles an hour. Assault troops ascended ladders to the second level. The landing gear was simple, a heavy jettisonable two-wheel dolly for takeoff and a set of four fixed skis for landing. The cockpit was mounted high on the nose, just ahead of the wing. Incredibly small for such a huge aircraft, it had manual controls for just one man. Made of metal tubing, wood and fabric, it was a rather delicate behemoth. But in Operation Sea Lion, one successful mission would be enough. Getting the enormous 321 into the air was no minor feat. After much debate, the Troika Schlepp, or triple train, of three Messerschmitt ME-110 twin-engine fighters was used. The glider was attached by steel cables, simultaneously released when the 321 was ready to sail into action. Takeoff was the truly treacherous part of the mission, and the immense craft was often assisted by eight hydrogen peroxide-fueled booster rockets mounted under the wings.
The ME321 was also towed by the Junkers JU90, or by Heinkel's unusual five-engined HE111Z. And although the airframe was light and in many ways delicate, it was also durable. Under tow, it could safely reach speeds of up to 132 miles an hour. All it now needed was safe passage over the channel and through British skies. Given that, it could easily bear its lethal cargo safely to English soil for the final battle. But RAF pilots had plans of their own. Over Britain, they fought tenaciously twisting and turning high above their homeland, they turned back Goering's invincible Luftwaffe and bought England precious time. Hitler's dream of bringing down the empire lay aflame and smashed across the British Isles. After the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe's facade of invincibility vanished. In now contested skies, the slow and vulnerable Gigant glider needed improvement. The 321's jettisonable takeoff gear, consisting of a four wheel dolly weighing nearly two tons, was equipped with a two wheel main bogey and two castering nose wheels. Takeoffs were greatly assisted by the use of rocket assisted takeoff or RATO units. Attached to special fittings under each wing, the rockets ignited as takeoff began. They gave the Gigant over 1,000 pounds of thrust each. They burned for about 30 seconds and helped lift the glider off the ground in just under 4,000 feet. Once their fuel was gone, the units were jettisoned. Each came equipped with its own parachute for recovery and reuse. Before takeoff, each RATO unit's parachute was carefully packed and attached to the forward bulkhead. The propellant was a pure form of hydrogen peroxide called T stoff and a toxic solution of calcium permanganate called Z stoff. They were extremely hypergolic, meaning that when they came into contact, they ignited. They were difficult and dangerous to work with and were so corrosive they dissolved flesh. The volatility of these liquid fuels provoked an interest in the potential of solid fuels and their safety. On many occasions, liquid-fueled aircraft simply exploded on the runway, and accidental losses often exceeded those in combat. Early tests of the solid fuel Vasag 61 were conducted with a modified DFS-230 glider. Two small Schmidding 109 rockets were mounted under the glider's wings, and provided up to 330 pounds of thrust for 25 seconds, enough to get the DFS-230 into the air without any other source of power. Other Schmidling 109s were tested as auxiliary propulsion units on the Junkers Ju-52, Four of these tiny rocket engines produced over 1,300 pounds of thrust. They cut the transport's normal takeoff run in half, but sent shudders through the plane, stressing the airframe incredibly. Without the help of the rockets, the Ju-52's normal takeoff roll, with a glider in tow, was lengthy and laborious. The loss of a single engine upon leaving the ground would certainly bring the mission to a quick and tragic end. But with rockets attached, power was never a problem. With its four Schmidding 109s mounted just aft of each outboard engine, the old transport, even with a glider in tow, nearly leapt off the ground and climbed away rapidly. 
And even with the possibility of a rocket's misfire, the safety advantages far outweigh the dangers. The G-Gun can accommodate payloads larger and heavier than any Allied transport. Later in the war, small tanks were often carried to the frozen combat zones of the Eastern Front. These were ramp-loaded under their own power. The cargo bay was vast for an aircraft born of the tiny primitive gliders that soared through the Rhone Mountains just a decade earlier. Once fully loaded, the heavy wooden ramps were manhandled out of the way and the huge hinged cargo bay doors of steel tube and fabric were closed and secured. The ME 321, supported by its takeoff dolly, was then. to its three tow aircraft. In this case, three Messerschmitt 110s act as a Troika schlep. This, the most common way to lift the world's largest operational glider into the air, was far from the safest. On one occasion, the Gigant's rockets didn't fire in unison, and the lumbering craft veered suddenly after liftoff. In an instant, the three tow planes turned into one another, and the resulting mid-air collision brought the glider and its human cargo of 120 troops crashing to earth. There were no survivors. At the time, it was one of the worst aircraft accidents in history. Success or failure of the Troika Schlepp towing procedure depended entirely on the flawless operation and unity of the trio of towing aircraft. Engine failure on one of the 110s was tolerable, but anything more would almost certainly prove catastrophic. Control and lift on the Gigant were marginal during takeoff, and even in level flight, this massive plane left precious little room for error. Unlike the sport gliders of old, where mistakes were just stepping stones on the road to discovery, the Gigant demanded the utmost precision from the men flying it. Before long, a strange yet practical attempt was made to lessen the dangers of lifting the Gigant with three tow planes. Following an off-the-cuff suggestion by famed Luftwaffe ace Ernst Udet, the Heinkel company fused two HE-111 bomber airframes together. The resulting hybrid had landing gear consisting of four main wheels and two tail wheels, along with a new wing center section and a fifth engine. Called the HE-111Z Zwilling, it was without question the strangest and most powerful glider tug of the war. It could tow a single Gigant or up to three Gotter Geo 242s at one time, able to cruise at 140 miles an hour at an altitude of just over 13,000 feet. It was perfectly suited to the task. Although difficult to fly, the Zwilling was a novel answer to the problem. Bizarre when viewed from almost any angle, it remains one of the oddest aircraft ever to take flight. On June the 22nd, 1941, Hitler committed his fatal mistake. In Operation Barbarossa, 
three million German soldiers swarmed into the east. The Führer warned, this is a war of extermination. With weapons like the massive railroad cannon that could fire 70 miles into the Russian heartland, the apocalyptic invasion of the Soviet Union was underway. In the vast frozen landscape of Russia, supply was paramount. However, it quickly became a war of attrition, and in their struggles in the east, German armies were nourished by the Ju-52 anti-U transport. The simple old plane was a workhorse, constantly moving supplies and equipment to and from the front. But as rugged as the anti-U was, she couldn't handle oversized cargoes. Later in the war, the larger Junkers Ju-90 was pressed into service but couldn't match the 52's rugged reliability. Originally developed as a 40-seat airliner for Lufthansa, this all-metal four-engine Junkers served the Luftwaffe briefly until 1943. At that time, it was replaced by an even larger aircraft, the Junkers Ju-290. But it was also no match for its older relative. Attention again turned to the glider. It was hoped that larger gliders, powered by their own propulsion systems, would pay off as bigger, more effective transport planes. Gotha's GO242 surprised many with the ease and effectiveness with which it took on engines. Now called the GO244, it saw limited service with the Luftwaffe during the war. Powered by captured French Gnome Rhone 14M radial engines, it proved practical and rugged. Still, it was no match for the venerable Ju-52 and was never mass-produced. The Gigant, however, with enormous cargo space and great lifting capacity, was just what the Luftwaffe needed. Even with four engines, it still required a towed takeoff, so two more were added along with a multi-wheel, permanently fixed landing gear. Attached to either side of the fuselage, the landing assembly was a marvelous engineering feat. With it, the huge plane could taxi over the ruts and rocks of primitive airstrips. When it went into action in 1942, the giant, now called the ME-323, was the largest cargo aircraft in the world. But under the harsh conditions of the Eastern Front, the huge X glider was still lumbering and vulnerable to attacking enemy aircraft. It could take to the sky on its own, but was a hopelessly slow target, an easy prey to the tiny but lethal fighters sent to cut it down. Caught by Allied fighters, this gigant met a fiery death. Accordingly, it was armed. Four 20 millimeter cannon turrets were mounted on the upper wing and gunner stations were installed in the fuselage. Still an easy target, at least now its crew would give Allied flyers something to think about. Military gliders were flown by the Allies as well. British combat gliders such as the airspeed Horsa ferried troops and material throughout much of the war. Primarily of wood construction, it was a versatile aircraft with a generous cargo hold and relatively sophisticated aerodynamics. And like the Gigant, it was pulled to its release zone by tow aircraft. Like Germany, in the years before the Second World War, soaring was a popular recreational sport in America, an affordable way for the common man to enjoy the thrill of flight. But the glider was slow to catch on militarily in the United States. American military experts just didn't trust its capabilities. In spite of this, a craft built by Waco did enter into US military service. It was cheap to build and easy to transport. Destiny would soon carry the flimsy glider to glory. In the late hours, 
hours at D-1, June 5, 1944, nearly 20,000 American and British airborne troops steeled themselves for their flight across the English Channel. Painted with the invasion stripes identifying all Allied aircraft, the gliders were towed skyward bearing their human cargo. Spearheading the greatest invasion in history, they would pave the way for 156,000 men to land on the beaches of Normandy the next morning. Upon release, the gliders headed towards their assigned targets. Each flyer put his craft into a steep dive, and the land rushed up. The men sat tightly packed, arms linked, waiting for impact on the soil of German-occupied France. British Air Chief Marshal Lee Mallory described his pilot's precision landings as the war's finest piece of airmanship. Troops disembarked and fought to capture the road junctions and bridges guarding the eastern flank of the invasion beachhead. Many didn't make it. They were wrecked on the uneven fields below. The day of massive assault by airborne troops was brief. Gliders, whether taking men or materials of war into action, were simply too slow in a sky filled with deadly flak and nimble enemy fighters. But in spite of this, the Gigant and its line did usher in an aviation revolution of sorts because they led directly to the wide-bodied transport giants of today. Huge machines like the C-5 Galaxy transport mirror the work of Luftwaffe engineers who in a time of great turmoil struggled to perfect the largest plane of its day. Born of the tiny gliders that soared over the serene mountains of Germany, none of these lumbering mammoths remain. They arose in a time of chaos, and their world has long since passed away. But their legacy flies on. A giant of modern skies, the galaxy, is among the largest planes of today. And the realization of dreams dreamt on a European mountainside over half a century ago.